Okay, everyone. What's up? Gold here. And I'm going to be going over the uh, eight-game main slate we have here on uh, Wednesday, August 16. Um, wow, crazy night last night a little bit. Um, some predictable spots that pop Seattle, right, the Royals a little bit, Texas getting after Giolito, and also a couple of pitchers that made me look like an idiot. Notably, Jordan Montgomery at a stupidly high price tag, um, etc. Now, today it was kind of a, yesterday was a little bit of a tough pitching slate. Um, we had a lot of you know really goofy pricing and some weird spots. Um, today we're a little bit more standard, if you will. Right, we've got green numbers up at the top, which we kind of top of the pricing spectrum which we kind of expect. Red numbers down at the bottom, which we also kind of expect. Yesterday was all over the place. So um, today we got to do really kind of our same sort of analysis, just jump into the weeds here a little bit, do some pricing, some pitch mix analysis, et cetera, et cetera, and really do some kind of granular ownership uh, finagling, if you will, with our teams because we've only got the eight games. Um, but we got a lot of really good arms here. And, you know, down here at the bottom end of the pricing spectrum, not so much. Maybe some attackable guys. Um, so we're going to have to pick and choose as, well, we really always do. So we've got projections and ownership loaded, of course. As always, we do have the uh, the numbers up for the four-game early slate as well. Those are on the site, and it's SaberSim already. Um, we'll have updates you know, coming into lock as we normally do, uh, but let's just go over the the main slate here since we've got uh, a full eight games on it, uh, and we'll start with Boston and Washington. Uh, Paxton on the mound here at 8,200. Uh, now this is kind of interesting here. Um, 8,200 is kind of an attractive price tag for him for sure. Uh, we're not worried necessarily about you know, lack of raw strikeout stuff for Paxton, you know, from a, a fundamental perspective uh, and his point of view, right? Um, you know, 30% strikeout rate to the right-handers, maybe a little bit of a, of a delta here, uh, and just the 18% that he's exhibiting so far against the left-handers. I don't really worry about that too much. He does still have the slider and the curveball that he can work with, and he's got good velo still. Uh, at 95 on the four seamer to induce some swing and miss uh, to lefties as well. So a bit of short sample noise there. But we kind of get concerned with with Paxton. You know, it's not necessarily plate discipline overall, right? We'd like a little bit higher CSW. 29% is fine. 80% um, strain rate is going to come down a little bit. But for the most part, he's been very good uh, in his return this season. Where we get worried not so much in batting average, right, against the right-handers or just raw base runners, right? The control is good. It's just fly balls and power here um, that are kind of a, a problem for Paxton, right? 090 ground ball to fly ball, healthy line drive rate at 24% nearly. That's a concern. Just 15% soft contact induced and 36 37% hard contact. So it's a little concerning, and that makes him attackable, with a 180 ISO, give or take, to the right side of the plate. Um, now, here against Washington, there's really only a couple of guys, right, from the right side that we could be uh, concerned with. Number one would be Lane Thomas. He's got fantastic numbers against left-handers this season. He's 4,800, kind of a stiff price tag to be going after James Paxton. Um, you know, he's not going to swing and miss a lot, Thomas. So he's a, a viable sort of leverage play as James Paxton's ownership is going to, you know, hover around this 20% region all today. He's only got a 19% K rate, does Thomas, and he's got a 260 ISO with a 420 Woba against lefties. Really, really good numbers. Hard contact is up there north of 40% as well. So a high upside spot for Lane Thomas in particular. Joey Manessis, his power is totally dropped off the cliff this season as the league is really starting to figure him out a little bit. It's probably not going to return fully to the numbers of last year, but it's going to bounce a little bit, and we're seeing a little bit more production from him recently. Still going to hit a lot of ground balls. 
So that is playing into his batted ball profile a little bit as well. Um, and he still hits for a good bit of average, just not so much in the power. Even though, you know, 140 is not nothing. It's, it's not all that impressive. Just a 20% K rate for Manessis as well. So he's fine from the right side too. 4,300. You know, not a hell of a lot of value we could squeeze out of that price either, but uh, in play for sure. Cabert Ruiz doesn't strike out at all. He has a 5% K rate against left-handers, uh, which is fantastic. Hits 300, which is fantastic. Also has a 140 ISO, 24% line drive rate against left-handers. Not a lot of hard contact, so not a you know a ton of pure upside for those three guys outside of Lane Thomas, but. Uh, it's there, and they could make it a little bit difficult on James Paxton because they do have ground ball leans, and Paxton gives it up with line drives and hard contact to the right side. So I think it's viable to get to a couple of you know Nationals pieces here, mostly those three. I don't really want to deal with the Stone Garrett here tonight, even though I play him against most every lefty in baseball because uh, he's always cheap. The problem with him is he strikes out a crap load. Um, what is it, north of 30% for Stone Garrett? It, it, yeah, it's 33% against uh, left-handers this season, and we're not dealing with that against Paxton. Um, it's a, a pretty difficult spot for him to even make contact, and he's a heavy fly ball hitter. So the bat ball profile and the swing and miss just does not match up there. So it's mostly just those three guys that have slight ground ball leans. Riley Adams, if he's behind the plate today, um, or in, in there at a DH or something like that. Uh, he's got really good numbers in a short sample against lefties this season as well. A lot of power. You could mix in a national stack and get really off the board here against James Paxton. However, I do think he is in play as well because he does still have a lot of swing and miss against righties. Um, and he's still plenty serviceable against the left side too. Not going to have a lot of lefties in the lineup outside of like a C.J. Abrams, for example. So it's going to be mostly right-handers, and that 30% strikeout rate is going to play. So I think he's in play. It's the 8,200 that's attracting me mostly, not necessarily the pure strikeout matchup, right? Um, at just, what, 19% for the Nationals against lefties this season. 108 WRC+. plus. They'll create a little bit and hit for a good bit of average. So with a slightly warmer evening here in Washington tonight, 85 degrees, might play up offense a little bit. I don't think it's totally out of the realm of possibility that some Nationals get to a little bit of James Paxton. But I also think that he's very much in play. Um, can we squeeze much value out of 20% ownership on him right now? Probably not to the upside. Uh, so I imagine, given a few of the other guys, uh, given so many other pitchers rather, that we have to, to go to on the slate, eh, probably won't get to north of 20% Paxton here. But that price tag is admittedly pretty attractive uh, against a very platoon-heavy lineup. It's the it's the power of the fly balls and hard contact that have me a little bit concerned. Not going to walk a lot of people, though, so uh, he's very much in play to survive for six, seven innings and and take apart you know seven or eight of these guys from Washington. Mackenzie Gore going for the Nats, 6000 Now, I, I like the price tag for him. I really like the strikeout stuff, of course. 27% in aggregate is to both sides, 31% to the lefties, and 25.5% to the righties. That's really strong. Uh, the problem with Mackenzie Gore is that he gives up power, man. Like, he gives up a lot of power, and he gives up a good bit of batting average, really to both sides. 240 to right-handers is not horrible, right? That's about a you know, average or so, but a 330 to the lefties, he's exhibiting a little bit of a reverse split here, which is kind of surprising because he's got a good slider and a respectable curveball with a break-even four-seamer. He shouldn't be giving up this much contact and production to the left side, but he is. He's also walking 15% of them nearly. Um, that's a concern. 150 ISO is not a horrible figure necessarily. Combined with a buck 50 or so ground ball to fly ball and just 31% hard contact. You know, he could survive here, but he's got some holes definitely and is attackable a little bit with a couple of left-handers. That's notably Rafi Devers territory. They're going to platoon pretty heavily over here, Boston, I think tonight. Um, Yoshida is likely to get another day off. Been struggling a little bit. I think they're going to kind of give him a, a couple of days to clear his head. Um, so they're going to go pretty right-handed heavy here tonight and they'll likely have eight, righties in the lineup um so they're going to platoon very heavily and unfortunately for Mackenzie Gore that's where he gives up most of his 
raw power, 199 ISO, more in line with the actual X ISO. So in aggregate, he's kind of running a bit hot here to a t the tune of about 3%. In, in ISO um, in particular, 36.5% hard contact with a neutral ground ball to fly ball against the righties. That means he's far more attackable there. So with a 10% raw walk rate and a 12% barrel rate, he's just too much contact, too much barrel contact, that is, here for me to get too excited. I, I really do like the strikeout stuff, but this is a difficult strikeout matchup. And they've got some guys over here, Ref Snyder, Turner, Trevor Story, uh, that notably hit left-handers you know, exceptionally well. Uh, for power, however, Boston might leave it on the table a little bit for us. Not hitting the baseball out and over the wall, which we kind of need uh, when we're full stacking teams. Um, Rob Refsnyder didn't really have any power. He's a, more of an average type of guy that they put up at the top of the lineup. Justin Turner will hit the baseball in the air and hit for some power still, certainly. As will Trevor Story, of course, and Rafi Devers, definitely. So I think a... A viable five-man stack, if you want to get to a full five-man for Boston, would just be the top five, including Adam Duvall. He's at a playable 4,000. He's got historically better numbers against lefties, of course, than he's shown this season. Uh, outside of that, though, no, really not all that interesting down here at the bottom of the lineup. Uh, pretty poor batted ball profile mix and, and, and pretty poor actual results against this type of uh, batted ball profile of Mackenzie Gore for a lot of the guys down at the bottom half for Boston. So not all that thrilling. I'd probably prefer just short stacks of like a, a 2 3 4 Justin Turner, Trevor Story, Rafi Devers type. You want to mix in a ref Snyder because he doesn't strike out a lot against lefties and, and hits 300 or so. That's fine. Uh, and same thing with an Adam Duvall. I think that's okay. But I think overall, Boston stacks might be a little bit popular here tonight. And I think... I'm a little lukewarm on it. Um, not that I want to play Mackenzie Gore necessarily. The the price tag at 6000 ownership at sub-10%, that's going to keep him in play on an eight-game slate, sure. I think there's some other guys we'd rather pivot to that too, but you know, I, I don't really want to play him, but I may come off of Boston here a little bit and pivot it to some other teams um, that we'll get to here in a little while. So I'm kind of lukewarm on Boston, even though I do like a you know middle... Um, middle of the lineup type of stack, two, three, four, throw in a five, throw in a one if you want to get there. But uh, mostly kind of lukewarm on on offense. Um, outside of just some pieces, short stacks in this game. I do like Paxton a little bit. And you can play Mackenzie Gore for strikeout upside in tournaments uh, if you're not all that thrilled with Boston uh, against left-handers. I think they're okay. I think they could be serviceable. Um, probably not my favorite, but... Uh, in play for sure. Okay, we are frozen in the sheet here. There we go. Uh, let's move on to Philly and Toronto. Really interesting game here. Um, Aaron Nola going for Philly. And I want to play him uh, a lot more than I wanted to play Zach Wheeler yesterday. 9,000 on the mound for Nola. So that initially attracts me to him. I hate paying north of 10,000 for, for Nola. There's just too much variance with him anymore. Um, but when we get down to the, you know, upper 8Ks and 9K range, I really start to get attracted. Obviously, the matchup is terrible, you know, from a raw strikeout standpoint. However, from a batted ball perspective, a lot of these guys in Toronto, they just hit too many ground balls, certainly from the right side. The left-handers, they're going to strike out, and they're mostly fly ball hitters. So Aaron Nola still has some soft contact that he can induce there, right? Full 19.5%, 20% soft contact to lefties. With a fly ball lean, 080 ground balls per fly ball, just 31% hard. And the left hander strike out a boatload. Brandon Belt is at like 35% or something uh, against left handers this season. Um, huge, huge figure. Kevin Biggio strikes out 25% clip. Dalton Varsho, same thing with him against lefties. Um, if they're even, you know, in the in the lineup, I mean, they do a lot of kind of goofy stuff up there. Uh, it'll likely be those three left-handers, and those would be the three you'd be worried about from a raw power perspective here against Nola because he gives up still a lot of power, 202 ISO and the fly balls, right? Give up some homers on occasion, and 
some pop, right? But from a batting average perspective, which makes stacks a little bit difficult, he's just at a 240, which is a respectable figure. He doesn't walk anybody. The control is still excellent. All of the plate discipline numbers are still fantastic for Nola. And we may even be looking for a bit of positive run suppression regression for him to the tune of about three quarters of a run or so. Same thing with the strand rate, just 66% here. That's an exceptionally low number for Aaron Nola. Uh, so an attractive price tag, 9,000. I'm fine with, you know, 18, 20% ownership on Nola here. Good plate discipline. And I like the fact that he's going to be able to induce, you know, buck 15, buck 20 ground balls per fly ball to the right side. And he's got a lot of whiffs there still. Um, most of the right-handers over here, Witt, Vladdy, Springer, they're going to hit some ground balls. They do have Danny Jansen, Matt Chapman, you know, from the right side that will hit it in the air a little bit, but they're going to strike out. So I think Nola has some viability here. Vladdy's not going to strike out a lot, of course, but he hits some ground balls. Springer is still going to hit some ground balls. Got a little bit of swing and miss in him on occasion. He's kind of expensive. Witt from the right side has probably got to be my favorite from a batted ball perspective. He's about a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy. Um, and still makes a, a good bit of hard contact, doesn't strike out, right? So I think he'd be my favorite if I were to try and take some leverage and stack against Ola or something. But really, I don't want to stack against him um, because I think the strikeout stuff for him is going to play a little bit against Toronto. I think this is a sneaky, okay spot for Aaron Nola, uh, kind of contrary to Zach Wheeler yesterday, who did only pop for about 20 points. His upside was capped. I think there's value that we can squeeze out of Nola here. Uh, at this price tag, and maybe a little bit out of the ownership as well. Kevin Gosman going for Toronto. I want to play him too. I think this is fine. 10-5. I'm a little concerned with the price tag relative to all the, the other available arms we have in the slate, but I do like it. Um, the plate discipline for Gosman is fantastic, right? Everything here is great. We would like a little bit more in the called strike department out of him, but he's at 30% CSW. We're fine with this. The chase is still elite for him. The control is still elite, as is the raw swing and miss, 32.5% K rate for him. Where Gosman gets in trouble is barrel contact, right? 10.5% barrel rate is a notable figure. And he gives up a lot of hard contact, man. He's only giving or inducing about a buck 20 ground balls per fly ball. Got some line drives in him against the right side and 39% aggregate hard contact. This is very attackable. So that's what worries me with Gosman. It's not the swing and miss, of course, right? 32.5% aggregate. K rate is fantastic. Buck 67 ISO allowed is a fine figure. 300 Woba is good. Two, sub 240 batting average allowed is also great. So I think Gosman is certainly in play here against the Phillies. We saw what Kikuchi did to them, yet, them yesterday. He made me look like kind of an idiot. They'll still swing and miss over here. Against right-handers, 23.5 aggregate strikeout rate for the Phillies. They hit some ground balls, so Gosman's still going to be able to induce a little bit there with the key splitter that keeps him down in the strike zone, notably against the right side. He'll give up some pop to the lefties, of course. That's Schwarber and Bryce Harper territory. I prefer Bryce Harper because uh, he's just a better hitter than Kyle Schwarber, and Schwarber strikes out a boatload. But both of them are going to swing and miss here a little bit. Um the only guy from the left side, right, that's not going to strike out here is Bryson Stott. And, I mean, do we really want to go out of our way to be playing Bryson Stott against Kevin Gosman? I don't think so. So I don't want to play any of the righties, right? They're all going to swing and miss a lot, including Alec Bohm, who doesn't strike out. Um, and Gosman's excellent against the right side. So I don't really want to play any of the Phillies here tonight. I do like Gosman a good bit. It's just the price tag combined with, you know, a healthy 25% ownership and this barrel rate with hard contact that make me nervous with him. So um, given some other guys, would he be my first in and in like single entry three max type of stuff? Probably not. But if you land on that, if you get to a cheaper stack somewhere like a Seattle, for example, who we'll get to, uh, I think this is fine throwing in Gosman. I've got no problems playing both of these guys on the mound. Really? I think it's a sneaky, okay spot for Aaron Nola. Um, you know, if his ownership steams a little bit, then, you know, maybe we come off. But uh, I'm okay playing uh, a little bit of NOLA in, a, admittedly, a pretty difficult matchup against Toronto. All right, let's move on. Yankees and the Braves still in Atlanta. Randy Vasquez going for 
New York. Um, 6,200, I don't really want to play him. But I think he might be able to survive here a little bit. Uh, I think there could be some survivability and some suppression in the tank for him. Now, he's got a lot of you know short sample noise that we've got to flesh out here, right? Just four appearances, uh, three starts for him this season. He's got no pure whiff stuff so far, just 15% aggregate K rate and a 10% walk rate, right? So that's bad. 57.5% strike one, that's bad, right? 23% CSW, that's terrible. Um, so this is a little concerning. He's also got you know suppression metrics, expected suppression metrics pointing three and a half runs higher than is realized so far. Uh, this is not a recipe for success against Atlanta, naturally, right? 94% strand rate. Let's like we're we're in ridiculous territory here. However, I think the pitch mix could play a little bit because he's got five pitches that he can work with. They could be serviceable from uh, a diversification standpoint. And a 3x fastball mix with a slider and with an off-speed pitch and a changeup, that can keep him in play and down in the strike zone a little bit against both sides of the plate, right? Two-seamer slider against right-handers, cutter change a little bit against the lefties to keep him down and induce some soft contact. So I think there could be a little bit of survivability for him here. I don't necessarily just want to slam in Atlanta going after... Yeah, you know, Randy Vasquez. They're going to be pretty popular once again because that we've got the uh, Michael Harris, you know, two hole shenanigans still happening, of course, and cheaper guys down at the bottom of the lineup that make stacks a lot easier to get to when you want to play Olson, Riley, and Acuna. Um, it's probably going to be Travis Darno behind the plate today. He's a fine catcher piece to throw in 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 stacks, of course. Marcelo Zuna's been like he got there again yesterday. He's been fine. Um, Eddie Rosario going to be in there once again as well. But I think the pitch mix here with a full five uh, into quiver could help Vasquez survive a little bit. I think he might have four or five innings here and a little bit of suppression uh, in the tank. So I don't want to play him because I don't think the swing and miss is going to be there. And that's going to, you know, that's obviously a huge concern. I've got no problems playing Atlanta. Let's you know, don't get me wrong here. 85% contact rate so far is just way too high against this team. Um, so go ahead, play Atlanta. I got no problems with that. But if you want to pivot it to some other stacks, I don't think this is bad at all. I do see some underlying metrics here, notably in a very low barrel rate so far. Um, you know, and some some low power allowed that could allow Vasquez to survive and kill a lot of Atlanta teams. Um, you know, they're still expensive, right? Kudia's 66, Riley's 58, Olsen is 6,400. Not the greatest here today. So you want to play some of the cheaper guys? Yeah, I think that's that's the viable stack, obviously. Um, but not my favorite necessarily here for Atlanta today, despite the fact that they're easier to stack now with Albies out of the lineup. Charlie Morton going for the Braves. Um, now, initially, I looked at 8,500 and 10% ownership, and I'm like, okay, all right, we could get attracted to a little bit of Charlie Morton here against the Yankees, because the Yankees are absolutely awful. Um, I'm still kind of attracted to him here at, uh, you know, it's sort of a middling price tag, low ownership for sure. But Charlie is starting to struggle here a little bit. Um, and we've talked about the, you know, he was great earlier in the season, but we talked about the regression that was coming to Charlie Morton. I started stacking against him like two and a half months ago, right? And it just so happens that now, like, he's starting to struggle a little bit more, and the price tag's finally coming down on him. Um, I think this is a playable spot for him. However, the stuff against right-handers is concerning. Uh, he's pretty damn good against the lefties, inducing a lot of swing and miss still, but... The Yankees aren't going to have all too many lefties uh, that could really, like historically, for example, Charlie Morton has given up more power to the left side. Uh, he's really f kind of fixed that this year, and he's inducing a lot more swing and miss. So I'm not really worried about a Jake Bowers. He strikes out at a at an astronomical clip. Um, not really worried about Rourke bet behind the plate necessarily. Still missing uh, Rizzo, for example. Not really worried necessarily about Billy McKinney against righties. 
um, from a strikeout standpoint, right? And he doesn't give up all that much power, just a 140 ISO, not a lot of batting average either. It's the right-handers that I'm really kind of concerned with here. I think this price tag may be a little bit trappy at 8,500 and, a, you know, kind of attractive, but sneaky dangerous because he's only got the 21% strikeout rate against the right side, 37% hard contact, similar to Kevin Gosman, just a buck 15 ground ball to fly ball to the right side. That's very, very dangerous when you're in Atlanta. You know, it's 85, 90 degrees, whatever it is. And you got to get through Aaron Judge and some other fly ball hitters like uh, Harrison Bader, uh, Glaber Torres, a little bit Stanton for sure. Um, these guys' problems are strikeouts. Not necessarily Bader, but Judge and, and Stanton definitely. And when you can't really induce a hell of a lot of swing and miss against these power hitters, you know they're going to be able to connect. And when you give up this much hard contact without balls on the ground, uh, this is very dangerous. So I th actually think this is slightly trappy, similar to like a Jack Flaherty last night. I think it's slightly trappy uh, against these right-handers over here. I th IKF, he hits too many, you know, way too many ground balls, but he didn't strike out at all. He's probably going to be in there tonight. Um, you can mix in a Glaber. He's very well priced here, at 3,900, and I like Judge at 6,000. Um, not sure of the, you know, pure ownership on Judge. Let's see if I can get a sneak peek. Um, into the Yankees' ownership here. You know, Judge always gets ownership, but tonight we're only seeing, you know, sub-10% on him, and there's value there. So I, I think Judge is one of the better outfield plays of the day, as he is always, but uh, today in particular, I think there's a, a good bit of value we can squeeze out of that, uh, out of the price tag and of the ownership. So I want to get to him. He's my favorite, certainly, as really he always is. That's not really surprising, um, but I think he's a good spot. Charlie Morton's still having control problems too, right? 11.5% walk rate. I think you could find a Yankee stack here somewhere. Uh, it's probably just a short three-man for me, um, but if you want to mix in a Jake Bowers at a cheap 2700 at first base, that's fine, or an IKF as a contact piece, that's fine as well to mix in with a Judge, Glaber, Stanton type. That's okay. Bader in the outfield is okay at a cheap price tag. Um, even though there's not a lot of power there for him. So there, you could find something here getting after a little bit of Charlie. If he starts walking everybody, like, he could give up a couple of, you know, two-run bombs, and he's dead in the water. So I think it's a slightly trappy price tag at 8500 Um What I think here, I think the Yankees might see a little bit of value, especially in the betting markets. You're getting, what, 8.5 to 5 on them right now, plus 175 in the betting markets. I think it's an okay play, uh, even though you get Atlanta, you got to get through Atlanta's offense and fade them for a full nine innings. Um, I think there might be a little bit of value on some of the Yankees over here, not necessarily Vasquez, but I think you could come off a little bit of the Braves here in DFS. Um, underlying metrics here suggesting to me it, it, it could be some variance that you run into. Okay, let's move on to uh, the Angels and Texas. Jordan Montgomery made me look like a jackass um, as, as I was you know, kind of – expecting a little bit yesterday after I dogged him so hard. Uh, in any case, I might I might see a, see a little bit of the same here today with uh, Reed Detmers. I dog him a lot. Um, I've been stacking against him for years. And, I, like, he's just so difficult for me to figure out. I don't know why he doesn't have good swing and miss against the left side when he induces really good value on his slider uh, and his curveball, for the most part. Um... He's only got a 17.5% K rate to lefties, and he gives up a lot of power there. Now, yeah, we got short sample noise, but this has kind of persisted for the last little while. He's always given up a lot of hard contact, so this is why I stack against him. But he's got swing and miss that just kind of blows you out of nowhere uh, against the right side sometimes. And he's done that a couple of times this season where you just stack against him, or at least for me, I stack against him. Um, because the fundamental spot is terrible for him, and he, he just makes you look like an idiot. Could that be one of those spots today? Uh, I think it might be. I'm, I'm not definitely not going to play him. I'm going to stack against him, because I always stack against him. Um, the problems for Texas are really just like pure swing and miss from the power hitters like Addy Garcia. Um, but Semi doesn't strike out a lot. Corey Seager, he doesn't strike out a lot, and we saw what he did yesterday. Uh, 
Nate Lowe, you know, he'll strike out a little bit, 23% or something against lefties. Um, you know, but he's still a, a fine contact hitter right up in the three hole usually. Uh, most of the guys over here are fly ball hitters, and they're difficult to get through um, because they hit for a lot of power, and they've got Wobas, you know, north of 330, damn near every single one of them. Uh, and they've got pop and good contact skills top to bottom. So it makes it very hard to go after. However, with a slight fly ball lean here for Detmers and 30% Ks in the tank against what's likely to be still a, a very righty-heavy lineup, um, I think that could put him in play a little bit. I'm not going to do it because I don't really trust him. He's hard for me to figure out, and I do not trust fly balls and hard contact numbers at this rate. So I'm just going to stack against him because I trust Texas uh, a hell of a lot more to get to Detmers than I trust Detmers to be able to get through a very good lineup. Um, this is the third time they're seeing him this season. And generally, you know, the more times that an offense sees a starting pitcher, I tend to side with the offense. Um, and this is Texas, right? I just generally don't play pitchers against them. I think there is a route for Detmers to get there today um i'm not going to do it so by all means in deep tournament stuff if you land in an 8000 you're probably not going to get all that much of an argument from me uh but y yikes man this is a really dangerous spot i would not be surprised if texas puts up another real crooked number this is a very very good offense man and i would not be surprised if they're holding a, a trophy at the end of the season um on the other side you got john gray 6900 now he's at a He's at a much better price tag now, right, than the eight, mid-8,000s, 9,000, 10,000 even that we've seen John Gray this season. Um, that puts me on to him a little bit more. He's right-handed against the Angels, who are garbage. However, uh, John Gray doesn't have the same type of stripe out, strikeout stuff that Scherzer has, for example. Um, I want to be very careful with John Gray because I think he's still full of a hell of a lot of variance, even though he's got a really good slider and a pretty damn good change. He just doesn't throw it past anybody. He's inducing, you know, soft contact and rollover type of contact. Um, it, but, like, it it's pretty suspicious here because he doesn't throw it past anybody. Just a 20% K rate to the left-handers, 21%, give or take, to the right-handers. Bad fastball. When his fastball is bad, he gets really bad, and he can be right over the middle of the damn plate, and he's put up a couple of real crooked numbers for you um, if you've landed on him, notably in his first start back off the DL, off the blister or whatever it was, against Toronto when he just got blasted. That set off about a, what, eight-game eight stretch where he's just, like, he was 10 points or less. Um, you know, he had one at 14, one at 12, so, like, whatever. Two starts ago, popped a little bit against Miami, five and a third, six Ks. Still gave up three runs. Got a win out of it. Only 17 DK points, so a little inflated there. Results-wise, his last outing against San Francisco was fantastic, right? I believe we may have talked about that. Um, yeah, maybe not. Seven innings, seven strikeouts, no earned runs in San Fran. Well, this is back in Texas, and he doesn't have swing and miss really against a lot of the lefties over here. So Mickey Moniak, 4,200. I like the price tag for him. Shohei Otani, of course, and maybe a little bit of a Mike Moustakas. These guys don't strike out a hell of a lot. Of course, Moniak and Otani will, but that's not necessarily John Gray's strength against the left side. So with a very suspect line drive right here to both sides of the plate, 24.5%, 26% to the left side, I want to try and get to a couple of lefties, I think, from the Angels, Moniak Otani and Moustakas. You could play a Renjifo. He's not fantastic. Uh, you could play a Matt Dice. Not fantastic. Um, I think a game stack here is very much in play with Texas going after some Reed Detmers in hard contact and a few Angels pieces that have really, really good numbers against righties and a highly variant arm over here in John Gray that's seeing a lot of ownership right now at north of 20%. I think it's fine to, if you can make this happen. I haven't tried to build one just yet, but uh, initial look seems kind of attractive. You know, play Semyon Seager, Addy Garcia, 
and, I don't know, Mitch Garver maybe, or Jonah Heim, Zeke Duran. He's in play with Moniak Otani, Moose. If you could figure out something like that, uh, I, I think that's very much in play. Hunter Renfro, 3,200 in the outfield. think that's okay, et cetera, et cetera. So offense really, for the most part here for me, I'm probably just going to leave Detmers off because I don't play guys against Texas. Um, and I'm going to come in under on John Gray. I don't really like this. I'll probably have some you know, building a lot of teams, but yeah, not north of 20%, I can tell you that. Okay, let's move on to the White Sox and the Cubs. Another game that's going to be really popular here. Kind of a, um, you know, like a pseudo win game here at Wrigley tonight. Kind of warm, you know, 80, 85 degrees, whatever. So naturally, a lot of ownership is going to uh, migrate to this game. Well, and, and we got two arms here. Mike Clevenger, Javi Assad uh, going on the mound. Clevenger at 5,700. Um, now, I don't play Clev anymore. Like, he just doesn't have the raw upside and swing and miss for me. And he gives up too much pop to left-handers. It's a pretty serious problem, despite the fact that he's got a you know a playable changeup. Uh, he still doesn't induce swing and miss with it, and he gives up way too many fly balls. Really where Clevenger excels anymore is the soft contact, right? 20% soft contact to lefties and a low hard contact rate, 28%. That's attractive. Plate discipline, for the most part, despite the lack of swing and miss and pure CSW, is still good. Walk rate a little... Elevated here at 9% in aggregate, but it's not horrific or anything. 62% strike one is good. You know, we just need more chase and swing strikes out of him if we're going to consider getting excited in DFS. Um, maybe some negative regression coming to Mike Clevenger here. You know, expected metrics pointing about a run and a half higher than the realized ERA. Big strand rate north of 80%, etc., etc. et cetera. However, 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 I do think with so many fly balls here that Clevenger, with a lack of hard contact, could survive. And I'm concerned that the Cubs are probably going to be a little bit too popular here. Now, the the wind and the kind of warm weather throws a wrench in those plans. I was planning on fading the Cubs here um, a little bit, but I think I might have to just kind of eat it and have some exposure because the 10-mile-an-hour wind at Wrigley is you know, a little bit notable, even though it's kind of a, a washout figure at most other ballparks. It's not necessarily at Wrigley. So with slightly warmer weather, so many fly balls, uh, I think that can put some uh, really both sides here, some righties or some lefties, in play a little bit. Uh, I'm mostly homer hunting here, I think. Mike Talkman is a, is a good play, I think, at 3,700 with a ground ball profile from him. Same thing with Ian Happ at a neutral ground ball to fly ball. Um, Cody Bellinger, heavy fly ball hitter. I'd probably come off of him because he's 5,600. Even though Clev does give up power still, um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if, if Bellinger hit a ball out. But from a batted ball perspective, I'd probably prefer to pivot it elsewhere. Jamer has got to be my favorite, I think. Not from a price perspective. He's 4,700, probably going to be in the six hole. That's kind of tough to stomach. Uh, Chris Morell, I do like here from the right side at 4,600. He's got killer numbers, of course. Um, so I think it's okay if you find some Cub stacks. I think they'll probably be a little bit too popular for my liking. Uh, Nico is fine, just doesn't have a lot of power necessarily. Right, All these guys are fine in stacks, but they are expensive. And given their price tags and higher ownership, I think Clevenger could survive here a little bit. Um with the lack of hard contact, I need a little bit more out of this. You know, I'd rather just, like, take shots against 38 39% hard contact rates against, like, Gosman, for example. Um, you know, with neutral ground balls per fly ball, for, for instance. Uh, then try to, you know, take a lot of ownership on the Cubs and go after 28% hard contact that Clevenger induces, for example, or allows. So that's kind of a long-winded way to say that I'm a little... Lukewarm on the Cubs here a little bit, despite a an attractive weather spot and a guy that I generally like uh, attacking because he, he pitches to so much contact. I think both sides are certainly in play. I have no problems playing some Cubs. Uh, if you want to get there against Clevenger, go ahead. I don't want to play him, so yeah, sure, play the Cubs. But I think he could survive a little bit here and kill some Cub stacks. And similarly, Javi Assad, I think he actually is in play, as a matter of fact. Um, he induces so many ground balls, and the White Sox over here have one fly ball hitter. One. They've got a couple of guys that are slight 
you know, ground ball leans, but, you know, tending toward neutral in like Yasmani Grandal, for example. Um, you know, but that's, it's Luis Robert, and it's pretty much it from a ground ball to fly ball ratio perspective. Everybody else hits way too many ground balls. Aloy, Yohan Mokata, Andrew Vaughn, um, Elvis Andrews, Tim Anderson hits you know, four ground balls per fly ball against righties. Um, now, they're attractive price-wise, of course, and that's what's going to pop their ownership and their value scores here. But I think it's a little bit trappy against Javi Assad. He went seven innings in his last outing. Uh, I believe it was against Toronto. And I think he stretched out enough to give us a little bit of value. He's 6,400. He struck out just two against Toronto. That's not all that surprising. But he only gave up one run. And the control was great. You know, that was an 18-point outing for him. Um he was at a similar price tag, 6000 And against this team, I'd much rather go after the White Sox than Toronto. I think it puts, you know, mid-20s DFS points, uh, over here on DK at least, within range for us. He's got a six-pitch mix that he can go to work with, right? Not so much in the secondaries. 5% of a curveball, 5% of a change, both bad. Um, you know, so let's not get things confused here. It's not going to throw it past a lot of guys necessarily, just an 18% aggregate K rate, but it's the ground balls and the lack of hard contact, similar to Mike Clevenger, that I'm kind of attracted to here. Not a lot of power that he gives up, not a lot of batting average. So despite some contact, 81% for Clev, 84% for Javi Assad, I think both of these guys could survive. And, uh, and I think despite some attractive weather, I don't know. I think I might come off of some stacks here. I don't, you know, I'd much prefer the Cubs um, because they're a better offense. And, you know, I don't like playing the White Sox pretty much ever. So I think Javi Assad could be in play here, 6,400, if you need to get all the way down here. He's a really off-the-board play. It's probably not necessary. Um, and don't get me wrong. He pitches to 84% contact. He could very well... You know, put a couple of guys on base with a 10.5% walk rate, right? Bad strike one, and then give up a bomb to Luis Robert. For example, you know, Andrew Benintendi doesn't have any power, but he's 2,800 now. Tim Anderson, 3,100. Um, these guys are very, very, very cheap, and that puts stacks in play. But I'm going to come off of it. I think they're going to be too popular for the relative upside that they offer, I think. And I think a Javi Assad deep tournament play is pretty shrewd, and it it could actually work, um, but don't hold it against me if both of these guys, Clevenger and Assad, give up a seven spot in three innings and everybody's just off to the races. Okay, let's move on. Seattle and Kansas City. Luis Castillo, I've got no problems here um, outside of the bad changeup. I've ranted about this ad nauseum all season with Castillo. It's, it's, it's a horrible, horrible pitch. He comes in three quarters on a release point with the four-seamer. He throws a two-seamer to left-handers also, in addition to the bad change, and it's just flat. It's right there on a silver platter for any left-hander to just, you know, have a field day with. Not so much in batting average, because he still induces swing and miss, right? Good velo and does still have swing and miss with the changeup. Uh, because the release point, while three-quarters and, you know, not super equitable in itself, it is the same between the four-seamer, two-seamer, and the changeup, right, which makes the changeup still a very difficult pitch to hit. However, when they make contact, it's hard, 35%, and it's in the air, 075 ground ball to fly ball, 222 aggregate ISO, two homers per nine to the lefties. That's how he's attackable. Royals have some lefties over here, probably four in the lineup tonight, Massey, MJ, Beatty, uh, maybe even five, Drew Waters and Kyle Isbell down at the bottom. It's viable if you want to take some deep tournament, you know, short stacks and homer hunt against Luis Castillo. I think that's fine. I don't want to stack against him necessarily. I mean, it puts it in play because if Luis Castillo is bad, like he's probably just going to be really bad. For the most part, the Royals are just not good enough, though, uh, against right-handed pitching. And Luis Castillo is good enough that even when he's bad, he's not all that terrible. Um uh, so I don't really want to be stacking the Royals here tonight necessarily. I do like 2,800 Michael Massey. I do like 2,700 MJ Melendez because they're still going to make hard contact against right-handers, and Castillo still gives it up, man, to the left side. 
I don't want to play a Bobby Witt at 55 or a Salvi at 39. Uh, they're going to strike out a good bit here, and Chase uh, is a pretty significant problem with both of those guys, even though Bobby Witt has been great recently. Um, I'm concerned about just pure upside for full stacks of the Royals. So I've got no problems playing Luis Castillo. What mostly attracts it to, attracts me to him tonight is low ownership, right? If this ownership were double this, I'd be like, okay, maybe we could you know, consider some Royals pieces more earnestly, but not necessarily at 15% ownership. I'd rather just play him. Uh, but it's close between him and Nola, as a matter of fact, for me. I'd probably rather play him because, I mean, the matchup is just better. $600 price discount, though, it doesn't seem like a big figure between the two, Castillo and Nola. Uh, but I think the the matchups are actually that close. And, you know, the ownerships are, are basically the same. So I'd just side with Castillo because the matchup's better. Um, you know, but it, it's closer than it might appear on the surface, I think. He still has a 10% barrel rate. So we have to be careful with this with Castillo sometimes even though he's got a lot of strikeout stuff. If the ownership steams uh, to, you know, whatever it steams to, then, you know, maybe we can make some decisions and be careful with it. But as of right now, I've got no problems going after the Royals here. Uh, we can keep their end of the game short. It's going to be likely Alec Marsh coming in um, as the long reliever. They have just an opener going, James MacArthur. He is a right-hander. Um, Seattle's going to be popular again. They probably should be because Alec Marsh has given it up in spades to everybody so far in the short sample that we've got. 33 innings, 8 appearances, just 6 starts, uh, and the suppression is not good here. He's got a 6 and a quarter ERA with expected, you know, about a run lower, but it's still about 5.5. Buck 70 whip, give or take. It's a terrible figure, 12.5% walk rate, 10.5% barrel rate here so far. 63% strike 1 is good. 29% chase is okay, and a 27% CSW is respectable. Could we see some positive regression come for him? Uh, yeah, sure, but I don't think I'm going to be taking chances here. Uh, I'm certainly not going to be playing him because he might only get four innings. Um, uh, Seattle is going to be popular once again. They should be. I think they're probably just the best stack of the day, uh, once again, getting MacArthur and Marsh, but their ownership is going to follow and it's going to be far higher than it was yesterday. Obviously, you know, we got an 8-game versus a 13-gamer, you know, whatever. But things are relative, and they're pushing about 12% aggregate ownership right now. And for a stack, that's, you know, quite aggressive, even on an 8-game slate. So they're going to be the most popular today. I think they should be. I think they are they are the best stack. Um, you know, but if you want to get off of this and, and just go elsewhere, like, you can always do that in baseball. I've got no problems there if we are looking for a little bit of positive regression for Alec Marsh. This is going to be kind of a you know pseudo-bullpen game for the Royals. And let's not forget, similar to yesterday with, with uh, Alex Fajardo against the Twins, for example, a bad offense like Seattle is a bad offense. Just because they took apart Jordan Lyles, well, you know, you and I could take apart Jordan Lyles anymore. So I want to be a little bit careful eating a hell of a lot of ownership on Seattle. That doesn't mean I don't want to play them. They're all still too cheap, and there's a lot of value here. Still with Julio, Gino, Ty France, Cal Raleigh, Tay Oscar, uh, all of these guys. Tay Oscar's a, a really good play once again. He went 5-for-5 five five last night somehow. Um, Zoni in the outfield, still a very playable 2,600. Uh, it's at everybody down at the bottom. Josh Rojas, still a good play, et cetera, et cetera, with ground ball type of hitters here from... All of these guys from the, uh, well, really both sides. This is a good batted ball matchup because Alec Marsh is a fly ball pitcher. So, um, yeah, let's get to Seattle again. But if you want to come off, I'm okay doing that. No problem playing correlated teams or anything like that. It's pretty attractive, as a matter of fact, playing some correlated teams with Luis Castillo, seeing just 15% ownership right now. So I, I like that a good bit. And no problems getting to some Seattle. They're about 2-1 to one in the betting markets right now. Seems okay. Not sure I want to lay it. Um, you know, but I think that's a, probably an okay parlay piece if you want to get there. All right, let's move on. Baltimore and San Diego. Dean Kramer on the mound for Baltimore, 7,100. I'm going to leave him off. Now, it's a fishy tournament play, right? Very low ownership, and Dean Kramer does this sometimes, man. He's super frustrating. I stack against him literally every single start. 
The hard contact to the lefties has persisted for as long as I can remember. Same thing with the righties. He's attackable there, too. Gives up power to both sides, 213x ISO. He's got average strikeouts to the right side, 23.5%, but well below average to the left side, 19% there. Neutral ground ball to fly ball for all intents and purposes, 090 or so. Slightly more fly balls to the lefties, which is why I prefer left-handers against him. I think Juan Soto today is one of the best plays in the outfield. Um, I don't know if I'd prefer him or Judge. Probably Soto, because eh, he's, he's just going to strike out far, far less in general. Um, and I respect Charlie Morton a little bit more than I do Dean Kramer. Um, but it, it's very close between those two, for example, you know, in the relatively same price range. Um, now, I do think Dean Kramer could survive here a little bit, though, because he's okay against right-handers. Doesn't give up a lot of batting average there. And still, as we talked about last night, with the possibility of Jack Flaherty being able to survive with good stuff against righties, well, that obviously didn't materialize. Flaherty was terrible. Um, I think we have kind of a similar sort of dynamic here with Dean Kramer. Um, I'd be more comfortable playing Flaherty, you know, than Dean Kramer. So give me San Diego a little bit more than last night. I'm a little bit more on them relative to yesterday. But that doesn't mean I really want to, you know, go out of my way to play San Diego necessarily here. Um, I think it's still kind of fishy price tag wise and bat a ball and, and results wise for a lot of the guys from San Diego from the right side of the plate. Not jacked about Tatis at 59, necessarily. He's got, you know, all the upside in the world, but I'd rather just play Soto. Um, 51 for Manny is okay, but he's not hitting right-handers for any batting average this season. He's got power, yeah, but I think my favorite right-handed piece is going to be Bogarts at 44. I think this is a sneaky, attractive price tag. Um, he's going to hit some ground balls, but against right-handers at least, but there's still some power to be found for, from the right side of the plate against Dean Kramer here. So maybe like a short stack, Juan Soto with a Bogarts and a Cronenworth or something like that. If you want to play one of the lefties down at the bottom of the lineup, like a Grisham or a Ben Gamble, I'm okay with that. I never play Trent Grisham because he's awful. Um, I'd much rather just play Ben Gamble. Um, so that that's fine. But now you're playing, you know, a, a nine-hole hitter on a home team in a, in a short three-man stack, which is, you know, kind of uh, kind of garbage. So uh, I'm lukewarm on the on the Padres here today. I, I love stacking against Dean Kramer, and if I don't do it today and the Padres put up a 10 spot in three innings, I'm going to be really pissed. So I'll probably have some. Um, but that said, I don't think they're a favorite stack of mine necessarily either. I don't. I'm kind of lukewarm on a lot of teams here today, which generally puts a lot of teams in play. San Diego, absolutely. Uh, I'm going to leave him off, um, but if you land on a 7,100, I don't think it's super crazy because San Diego is just an average offense for the most part. They only create at a stone break even 100 WRC plus against right-handers, but they walk a lot and they take some decent at-bats. Um, so they're going to make it difficult on Dean Kramer, and I'm questioning upside for him. Blake Snell for the Padres, 10-1. I got no problems, you know, really with the plate discipline, you know, outside of the, the walk rate and the freaking strike one rate. Um, you know, the CSW is great. Swing and strikes are excellent, right? The suppression is pretty fishy still for Blake Snell. 260 ERA with expected metrics pointing, you know, running a quarter higher. 86% strain rate is egregious. Uh, it's because he walks everybody and then he strikes everybody out behind them. So he's running really hot in that sort of dynamic. We've talked about this all year with Blake Snell. His problem is strike one. If he can establish early in the count, he can blow through the best lineups in baseball, and I've got no problem playing him in that respect. But it's still the regression that I know is coming for him, the very susceptible walk rate, the very questionable strike one rate, the price tag. Right? He's not in the mid-8Ks, upper-8Ks anymore like he was earlier in the season when we were playing him a lot at low ownership and when he started this you know, really excellent run that he's been on. And we like playing him at lower ownership. He's 40% now. So this has got to take me off. I just have to come in under. This is how I approach Blake Snell. And for the most part, it works out pretty well. Um, but he makes me look like an idiot a lot of the time or you know, sometimes whenever he comes in with... 65 plus percent strike one it's after that that the 
excellent secondaries here, really good change, really good curveball plus slider come into play. He's got a break-even four-seamer. It's just the control and elevating his pitch count that leads him astray and keeps me off of him. So at high ownership, a high price tag, I'd much rather just pivot all of this to Kevin Gosman at lower ownership. And I think his plate discipline is a little bit better. Um, I mean, it's quite a bit better. Let's not get it confused. Um, you know, the hard contact is still there a little bit. You know, for Blake Snell, he's got some susceptibility to contact and just putting too many people on on base sometimes. So, um, like, he walks some guys, he'll then give up a single, and then you're all of a sudden sweating in the freaking second inning when he's thrown 47 pitches, and he's got runners on second and third with one out. You know, like, it happens every damn start with this guy. Um, so at high ownership and a high price tag, I just come in under, and that's how I play him. But you always have to have exposure because he's got 31% Ks, and he will pop really, really, really hard and completely blow you out of the water when he throws strike one. Uh, he's been doing that more recently, so that keeps him in play. But I'd much rather just pivot it to Gosman or some of the other guys. There are plenty of arms that you can play. You don't have to eat this type of variance on Blake Snell tonight, and I certainly won't be doing it. Um, that said, I don't want to stack Baltimore against him necessarily, but you can and get leverage now. This is it, a good enough offense against left-handed pitching, right? 110 WRC or 109 WRC plus, 21% K rate, high walk rate, sneaky pop. So give me some you know, really deep tournament leverage stacks against Blake Snell. Uh, nobody's going to be playing them. And I'm not sure that should really be the case. There's a lot of variance with him, especially at high ownership. And he shits the bed quite often when he's very popular. So uh, I'm going to come in under. I'll probably have some Baltimore on the other side. I think they're very well-priced. Um, and I want to go after that and try and get some leverage here against Blake Snow. Okay, let's move on to the last game of the night here, Milwaukee and the Dodgers. Uh, Wade Miley's going for Milwaukee. Now, he could survive. I wouldn't be super shocked. you know. But he's got, you know... Contact issues to the right side here. Buck 62 ISO with a 292 Woba. You know, that's a fine number. Not a lot of batting average, right? 222 is a good figure because he still stays um, off of the barrel for the most part, induces some soft with the cutter changeup against the right side. Has a pretty equitable four seamer, as a matter of fact, even though he's only throwing 90 miles an hour anymore. Six pitches now that he's using this two seamer uh, a good bit more against. Uh, Same-handed hitters and the lefties. So he's got the two-seamer, and he's got some breaking stuff that he can induce a little bit of swing and miss uh, against same-handed hitters, right, to the lefties. 23% with the slider curveball. So that could keep him in play a little bit, but, I mean, do we really want to be going after the Dodgers with Wade Miley and a 17% strikeout rate, 58% strike one, and just 26% chase? I don't think so. Uh, I'm going to go back to the Dodgers. I don't think they're necessarily the best stack of the day, uh, but this is the Dodgers, and they're incredibly dangerous. Um, it's just if they start hitting the baseball over the wall, which they haven't really done, you know, in certainly to the tune of Atlanta, uh, they hit a lot of homers, but it's kind of been a while, really, since they've hit, like, five homers in a game like Atlanta does every damn night. Um so I want to go after a little bit of Wade Miley, I think, with some right-handers. He does give up pop, just a 15% strikeout rate there with neutral ground balls per fly ball and 37% hard contact. That's where I want to go after it. That's Mookie, that's Will Smith, that's J.D. Martinez, who was back. He came back last night. Med Rosario doesn't have any power necessarily, but he still hits 300 against lefties, and he's a good contact piece that will be in the middle of the lineup. You can always play Freddie Freeman. I have no problems doing that. Um, throwing him into a five-man stack with the t basically the top five guys here. Probably stay off of Max Muncy. His numbers against lefties this year are garbage, and he's going to strike out a lot. So I'll probably just leave him on, on the shelf and play some other third baseman. I'd rather play Kiki, uh, or Kike, rather, um, tonight at uh, you know third in the outfield as opposed to Chris Taylor, who was striking out at a 40% clip uh, against lefties this year. Uh, that's a big, big problem. It's always been his problem. Taylor, his strikeouts, and he's 3,800. He's probably going to be in the 7 or the 8 hole, so give me Kike instead. Um, and I don't really want to play 
you know, maybe Rojas or anything, but they're going to have probably seven righties in the lineup tonight. And I think that makes it difficult for Wade Miley. I do like a price tag. I do like the suppression and the six pitch mix, but not against the Dodgers. So I'm just going to play the Dodgers and, and hope they get there. Um, you know, kind of piece by piece as they have most recently. Kershaw is going for them in his second start back off the DL 9,900. All right. Yeah. Yeah. It's fine. I got nothing, you know, to really speak of negatively, uh, here, the plate discipline, of course, it's all great. Um, you know, the strikeout's great. Walk rate is always impeccable with Kershaw. Strike one rate, same same deal. Chase rate is very high this season, as a matter of fact, for Kershaw, 35%. Swing strikes are fantastic. CSW's great, too. 85% strain rate's a little fishy for him. We're going to see some negative regression come there, definitely. Um, you know, but he's one of the guys in baseball that could sustain something pushing 80%. But 85% is too high. He does have a suppression expect expectation pointing about a run higher than his realized at 250. So if that's how you want to come off a little bit of Kershaw, I'm all right with that. The Brewers have been better against left-handed pitching more recently since they were garbage for two and a half, three months at the early part of the season. They're at an 89 WRC plus now. They were at, what, 68 for however long this season. Still striking out 26%, still not hitting for average 230. Still just an average power team and an average on-base sort of team at a 304 Woba. A lot of ground balls here. Buck 35, and that's going to play into Kershaw's strengths, right? Buck 50, ground balls per fly ball for him. Everything is great for Kershaw. I got no problems. If you want to take a sort of leverage piece with like a, oh, I don't know, a punt Willie Adamas. He's going to strike out a crap load in this spot, but he's got power against lefties. That's fine. Tyrone Taylor known mostly for his bat, not his, or his, his glove, not his bat. Joey Weimer is okay at 2,200. Rather play him in the outfield if I got to choose. Brian Anderson is at a cheap 2,500, but not a lot of upside from him necessarily. Mark Conna kind of stinks. Monasterio is a very young hitter. Kershaw is going to win this matchup. Carlos Santana is okay from the right side. Not going to strike out a lot. Going to walk um, and make Kershaw work a little bit. So, yeah, sure, if you want to leverage that, but I'm not playing Wilson Contreras, or William Contreras, excuse me, at 50 or 4,900. Buying a plate, even though he's got great numbers against lefties. Same thing with Yelich, not playing him. So, yeah, I'm fine with Kershaw. I'm worried a little bit about the combination of 9,900 on the mound for him and Dave Roberts in the dugout for him because Kershaw is going to need to stay healthy for this team to excel in the playoffs. Uh, they have questions on the mound, and they need Kershaw healthy if they're going to win a, a World Series this year. So what's likely to happen is we get down here into August and September, Dave Roberts is going to start playing Dave Roberts games. And don't be surprised if Clayton Kershaw gets five, max six innings and 81 pitches every single outing from here on out into September. He'll go out, he'll get his work in, and they'll just yank him and make sure that he's healthy because they need him ready to go. Uh, otherwise, they have no chance in the playoffs. So that's what takes me off, really, at 9,900. I'd rather probably just play some other guys like Luis Castillo, like Aaron Nola, at similar ownership figures. Um, you know, the matchup is undoubtedly the best for Kershaw here, but I'm probably going to come in right about, you know, 10%, 12% uh, with my maybe – you know, squeeze in a little bit more, 15% or something with Kershaw. I don't want to get crazy with it because I think we're exposing ourselves to Dave Roberts shenanigans. And frankly, I just don't trust him. I don't trust Kershaw to go a full seven all that regularly anymore, um, you know, compared to some of the other guys on the slate. So, yeah, I think I'm going to come in right around uh, the market here uh, with Kirsch, even though I, I love Kirsch and I love the spot here. Uh, like he could very well go six and strike out eight uh, and still do it on 81 pitches or whatever. Um, you know, but he's going to get yanked and they're, they're going to go to the bullpen after that. Certainly if they've got a lead. So um, that's what you got to be aware with, aware of with the Dodgers coming into this part of the season. So that's kind of where I am. A lot of offense from, L.A. certainly against Milwaukee and very little pitching, um, you know, kind of lukewarm for the most part. OK, that's it. We're done. Let's go over a quick review. Boston and Washington. Some sneaky offense could be in play here. Um, Paxton, I do like the price tag. think he's in play as well. I think he could go seven innings, strike out nine or ten. Wouldn't be surprised against Washington. Also wouldn't be surprised if Paxton gets 
tagged for a couple of runs here by Elaine Thomas, Joey Manessis, maybe even a Kabert or a Riley Adams, something like that from the right side. So interesting game here. Probably no Mackenzie Gore for me. I think it's a difficult spot power-wise. And I think Boston, short stacks, uh, Justin Turner, Trevor Story, Rafi Devers, absolutely in play. Philly, Toronto, uh, I, I like Aaron Nola here a little bit. Um, now, it, I kind of get myself into trouble sometimes saying that with Aaron Nola, but I think this is a fine matchup for him and a pretty sneaky spot, to be quite honest. Now, we got to ca be careful of his ownership. If it steams too much, I'd rather just pivot it to Castillo or, or something like that, but uh, I think he's very much playable. Kevin Gosman, no problems with this. He's my favorite up above 10,000. Um, as opposed to uh, Blake Snell. So just give me Gosman against Philly. Uh, Philly's just a a a worse lineup and doesn't have, uh, you know, Gosman doesn't have the same sort of weaknesses that Blake Snell has. So, um, yeah, give me both of them. But Gosman does go, still give up hard contact and a, a high barrel rate. So I wouldn't be surprised if Schwarber, I'd kind of be surprised if Schwarber got there, but wouldn't be surprised if Harper got there or maybe like a Bryson Sod or something. Uh, against him. But yeah, pitching mostly here. Sneaky Toronto stacks? Yeah, probably not for me, to be quite honest. I like Nola a little bit. Uh, Yankees, Atlanta. Yankees, a uh, judge definitely. Yankee short stacks probably are in play here against Charlie Morton. If you want to full stack the Yankees, I'm fine with that. Um, I think Charlie might struggle here a little bit. I think that 8500 price tag, you know, while it appears cheap for him, could be a little bit fishy in this particular matchup. He's got bad numbers against right handers. And Atlanta, yeah, you could play him every night. I do think Randy Vasquez might be able to survive here with a five-pitch mix uh, against the Braves. However, he's got enough in the quiver to allow him to survive against both sides of the plate. And the lineup is significantly worse without Albies up at the top. Uh, he doesn't strike out, and that's a big, you know, that's not negligible. Um, you can't just wash that under the rug. So I think Vasquez could survive here against a you know, a weaker lineup. It's super dangerous, so I'm not playing him, but um, it's it's possible, I think. Uh, Angels, Texas, Reed Detmers. Uh, this is a really, really goofy, deep tournament play at 8000 It's kind of a an all-right price tag. You know, be like, okay, let's just throw him in a team or two and, and hope he just pops out of nowhere against Texas somehow. Uh, I'm not going to be doing it for the most part because I want to stack Texas again and go after him. I think the batted ball profile here is still okay for Texas. Um, plays into Detmer's strength a little bit more than it does for Texas, but this is still a super dangerous offense. Uh, I want to stack the game a little bit, too, if I can make that happen with some uh, Otani, Mickey Moniak, Moose plays. Maybe a Renhifo, Thice, or a Hunter Renfro from the Angels. Because I don't really trust John Gray, to be quite honest. Uh, they're bad, are the Angels, against right-handed pitching, but John Gray is not all that great in terms of swing and miss anymore. Nice price tag, 6900 but not all that thrilling, to be quite honest. High ownership on him, so I'm probably just going to stack against him and try and leverage that. White Sox-Cubs, I think for me this game might be a little bit popular. Um, but, you know, as we're talking through this, I'm probably not going to have... <laughs> doesn't sound like I'm going to have exposure to pretty much anybody. Uh, Clevenger and Javi Assad, I think these guys can also survive here. The weather is going to put these teams in play absolutely with a... You know, slight wind blowing out to dead center at like 10 miles an hour or whatever. Slightly warm, too. And these guys are going to pitch to a lot of contact. Javi Assad, though, is going to keep the ball on the ground. So I'd like to play him a little bit, if I could, in some deeper tournament stuff. I think that's a very viable play. There's only one fly ball hitter that you're scared of, or, or really at all, over on the White Sox. That's Luis Robert. So play him, definitely, um, on the other side. But eh, you might be able to come off of some White Sox stacks. And as I say that, literally, they just got beat down in the betting markets both of these guys were hovering north and of you know five and a half and six in their team totals and they've been whacked to the downside so you know keep that in mind uh there might be a little bit of resistance um you know for overs or something like that in the betting markets um from a dfs perspective yeah play the cubs they're my favorite if if I got to choose between the two against Clevenger, but I think Clev could survive also. Seattle and KC, Luis Castillo and Seattle are you know probably just my favorite team here today. I guess kind of by default, not really shocking anybody. Um, but after going through everything here, you know, I, from a fundamental standpoint, it just kind of makes too much sense. I think Alec Marsh going to go for KC as a long reliever, and he gives up too much power. So Seattle again once in play. 
uh, once in, let me try this again, in play once again. Um, and, but they're going to be popular, and you got to balance that. So you want to play some Royals pieces as a little bit of leverage off of Castillo. It's okay. They're cheap. It'd be just the lefties. I don't want any of the righties. So Michael Bassey, MJ Melendez maybe. Something like that as a one-off, but that's pretty much it for the Royals for me. Baltimore-San Diego. I want to play a couple of Baltimore stacks. I think um, they're probably my preferred really off-the-board sort of leverage stack here against Blake Snell. Uh, yeah, there's just too much variance for him. We talked about that uh, with the high walk rate. And the questionable strike one, um, and very high ownership and pretty high price tag. Just give me Gosman instead. But uh, you know you got to have Blake Snell if he blasts through Baltimore here with the really good secondary pitches. That's not going to be all that surprising. Um, he just has to throw strike one. That's the only thing that gets him in trouble. San Diego is ob obviously in play against Dean Kramer too. Uh, he could also survive. I wouldn't be shocked there because San Diego just kind of sucks. Uh, they're a break-even offense. They're not all that good, even though they've got some, you know, historically pretty good hitters over here. Juan Soto, certainly my favorite from the left side uh, for San Diego. Probably no Dean Kramer for me. I just never play him, and I always stack against him. But uh, he could be, you know, a piece that you land on in deep tournaments. Milwaukee and the Dodgers. No Wade Miley. Some Kershaw. Give me all of the Dodgers, as much of the Dodgers as I can get to from the right side of the plate. Um including Freddie Freeman, of course, as usual, at very little Milwaukee, probably none. Okay, that's it. We're done. Projections and ownership will be pushed to the site, of course, for all of the games, including the early slate. Uh, so good luck to everybody here on the main 8-gamer on Wednesday.